Thank you, everyone. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about property-based testing and using it on the ugly parts of your application. So I'm not going to talk about the ugly parts of property-based testing. Uh, that wouldn't be very good. OK. Um, I uh, live not too far away from here, so it's a, a pleasant journey here. And uh, I'm very happy to be back. I work uh, for a company in, in the US called Symbiont. They're in New York, so I work remotely for them. I write blog posts and articles on my website, uh, linked here. I do some various open source project maintenance, uh, and I record these screencasts at this site called Haskell at Work. And uh, basically, I spent the last year uh, writing a screencast video editor for editing my screencasts, because uh, why not build your own editor also while you're at it, right? Uh, and it's pretty fun because I started writing this about the time uh, Flatmap was last year. So it's, it's about a one year anniversary now. So that's fun to be back here and, and talk about this. Okay, um, so today I'm going to give a very short introduction to Hedgehog, which is a property based testing framework. Uh, it's available in a, in a few languages. I'm using the Haskell version. And I'm going to talk a bit about how we can appro apply property based testing for in a sort of industry setting. And finally, we will look at a couple of case studies from, from this uh, application composition and how I did property-based testing in, in, um, for, for this video editor. Uh, OK, let's see here. We go. OK, so let's start with the introduction to Hedgehog, just so we have some context on, on how that looks. So I'm not going to introduce uh, property-based testing in full. I don't have time for it, actually, so I hope you might have a, a vague idea on, on what it is. Um, but Hedgehog, uh, as the framework, is a property-based testing framework that can do random generated inputs, as most frameworks do. Uh, it has integrated shrinking, so you don't have to implement shrinking uh, for your generators manually. It has very nice error reporting. Uh, we'll see that this in action very soon. Uh, it supports concurrent test execution, and generators are values. So it's not so much driven uh, by the, from, from the types and uh, type class instances. Instead, generators are values, and you map over them using the functor instance. Uh, you can combine them with applicative, and you can chain them with monad instances, and so on. So the, the sort of canonical example of property-based testing is that if you reverse a list twice, you'll get the same list back. And in Hedgehog, it looks like this. This is a super simple um, example that everyone uses as a first one. So for all lists ranging from just uh, uh, the empty list up to a list of 10 elements, with elements being integers in the range uh, called linear bounded, meaning integers within the bounds of the data type. Uh, for all such lists excess, then if we reverse excess and reverse them again, we'll get back the original excess. Okay, uh, similar sort of easy introduction property would be an oracle test. So here we have my super sort that we want to test. So I'm, I'm trying to write like the, the next big thing here, uh, doing a new sorting algorithm, and I'm comparing it to some industry standard sorting algorithm, and they should always behave the same. If they don't, uh, which they don't, do not do here, uh, because my super sort is actually just identity, uh, then we'll get this nice error report from Hedgehog. Here it's saying, uh, it's telling about the number of tests it ran and how many times it shrunk the example to find like a minimal failing example. It shows as the generated value. So just below the generator here on uh, line 25, you'll see the generated value uh, zero and minus one, that's the list. Uh, it shows us where assertions failed with red and that little squiggly bar. Uh, it shows us the difference between the values, the actual and the expected. And this works on large data structures. So if you have a large data structure with just a, a little minimal diff, it will highlight the minimal diffs for you. Very handy. Uh, and it finally shows us how to reproduce this particular example deterministically. So if we wanted to debug this code, we can run this example, this exact example, over and over. Now, it's time for a little poll. So how many of you in here write sorting algorithms in your day job? Raise your hand. Uh, 
Olaf is sort of, yeah. I gave this talk at Chalmers, and there were actually some hands going up. That, that, was, that was fun. Um, but yeah, I, I would think that many of you might instead be working with stuff like backend systems with you know, databases and cloud integrations, whatnot. You might do front-end development and have GUIs and user events and inputs and all that. Uh, or you might be working with like, data pipelines, analytics, machine learning, whatever. So how do you, how do you write properties for those? That seems hard. Uh, these examples that I shown you, sh showed you before, they were really simple and sort of mathematically uh, nice. And, and yeah, your, your own code at work might be harder to, to find properties for. And also, you've, you will probably not find many examples of this online uh, on like, how people apply property-based testing in this setting. So that's what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I'm trying to convince you that property-based testing is useful for us in our regular work and in our sort of messy code bases as well. OK, um, so when we test the ugly parts, not everything will be these small, ideal, pure functions. Uh, if, if you have a lot of those and you can apply property-based testing there, then congrats. But uh, I think you will eventually have like, more complex behavior, sort of combining lots of small things to, to form a composite behavior. And it might be much more complex, and you have a larger state space. Uh, you might also have state in the end. So you might be connected to a database, uh, external services that have state. Uh, file systems, you might even have global variables. Uh, what do I know? But I think you do have eventually. And you might have non-determinism, so randomness or time, and you need to control clocks and stuff like that. So how do you test code with all this messiness? It's not very easy. And there's actually no difference between testing with properties for this kind of code uh, from you know, doing example-based testing, I think. So the same guidelines would apply here. Uh, we would like for our code to be testable by having each component only do one thing, so sort of single re responsibility principle. We want our code to be tested uh, or to be able to run deterministically. So we might have to do some stubbing of, uh, you know, stub out some service calls, some effects, and it doesn't really matter if you're using some, you know, effect system or dependency injection, whatever you have, you might be able to, uh, or you might have to control effects somehow. And you might also have to control stuff like clocks or generator seeds for, for random, randomness and so on. Or otherwise, somehow like parameterizing the component you're testing so that you can control its effects. And we often have to isolate the side effects in our tests so that tests can be run uh, individually and not like, um, clash with each other. So we can perhaps run each test in a separate database transaction and always uh, do a rollback. And we can pass temporary directories as arguments to, to uh, the components we are testing. So if they write and read files, then do that from a temporary directory instead of some hard-coded path. But yeah, it's, these are sort of general uh, guidelines for, for writing testable code. And I, you, you might be familiar with this. And you're still thinking, well, it's so hard to come up with properties. So I, I'm not convinced. And yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It is very hard to, to sort, of, sort of rewire your mind from example-based to, to property-based and finding the, the general behavior of your system. And I can recommend checking out this article, um, Choosing property -based, Properties for Property-Based Testing, by Scott Lashen. Uh, he lists uh, a bunch of general patterns for how properties can, can look. Uh, I'd encourage you to go through these and take some problems in, in your your code and try to apply these, see, see what, what could fit. Also try to find libraries and other people's property tests. So I think it's easier to, uh, to apply property-based testing for libraries because then you want to be general. And in, in applications, it's a bit less clear how it applies, but you might be able to find uh, stuff that you can study. And finally, the, the boring advice is to practice. Uh, it's always easy to say and, and hard to do, but um, try to like, involve your colleagues and, and challenge yourself within your team to, to apply this technique and see if you can improve your, your tests and like, oh, can we, can we even test this component with properties instead of examples? And try to express the product requirements that you talk 
w when you talk with non-technical staff in, in, your, in your organization, then you usually talk about requirements. Uh, maybe you can express those requirements and test those requirements as properties. That's very powerful if you can go there. There are also related techniques to property-based testing, which I won't cover today. Um, state machine testing or model-based testing, and something that I like to call database of inputs, which is basically also property-based testing, but not to generate the data. You might have a production database that you have anonymized and use that as input. Okay, let's start looking at the case studies now. So um, we're gonna look at case studies from Composition. This is the video editor I've been working on. Composition is a GUI application. It's modal, which means it's in one mode at a time. So if you're familiar with Vim, you know what a modal editor is. And while, like, okay, I'm gonna write an editor. Of course, it's gonna be like Vim. Uh, so this is also modal. And it features uh, a thing called uh, the hierarchical timeline. I will explain, explain this uh, in more detail shortly. Um, and then there are two killer features which uh, are there for my productivity when I'm editing screencasts. So it has automatic scene classification and automatic sentence classification. This means that when I import my recorded video and my recorded voiceover audio files, it will figure out, oh, you were editing stuff here, and there was something ha happening in the video, and here are your sentences that you said. In between was just noise or breath or thinking. Uh, so it will sort of pick out the good parts. Uh, this is very useful for productivity because I don't have to sit and edit everything by hand, which takes forever. Okay, so these are sort of the complex features in composition. The focus, which is like the cursor into the, the timeline, and the timeline transformations themselves. Uh, the video classifier, figuring out where stuff is happening in your video. The rendering pipeline, going from this hierarchical timeline all the way down to uh, output video file and then the application logic itself. The, the code that ties everything together, that handles all the user events and renders the GUI and so on. So this is where I spent most effort doing my testing because this is sort of the high value, high risk part. And the case studies that I've picked for, for this talk are these three. So the first one is timeline flattening. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. Then gradually more complex, the video scene classification tests. Um, those are still not doing a lot of effects and stubbing and, and stuff like that, but it's more complex behavior. And finally, the integration tests, where it's sort of testing the whole application uh, with, with all the parts, but with some effects uh, stubbed out. Okay. Before we can start looking at timeline flattening, we need to talk about what the timeline is. So I'll, I'll try to explain that to you first. So the hierarchical timeline starts, if we start from the bottom, it begins with uh, what's called a parallel. So a parallel is a structure with two tracks, uh, the video track and the audio track. In those tracks, you have video clips and audio clips. Those tracks are played in parallel. That's why it's named that way. If the video track is shorter than the audio track, then it will be padded with still frames from an adjacent video clip. So in this graphic, you'll see that there is an, a, a, an implicit gap in the video track, and that will be padded with the last frame of video clip one. This is a, the behavior that I want in my screencast. So if I'm editing something in my screencast and I'm talking for a longer duration, I want the last frame to extend so that it doesn't just go black or something. I can also edit gaps explicitly or manually. So here I put a gap between two video clips and a gap before the audio clip. So I can control how the, sort of the pacing of, of the screencast. These are also filled with uh, uh, still, still frames for the video gaps and the audio gaps are just silent. Then you structure those in sequences. Uh, in a sequence, you put all your parallels and each parallel is played until its end, and then the next one starts playing, and so on. This means that you can use multiple parallels to synchronize the starting point of clips. So these are the sort of synchronization uh, building blocks, if you will. Okay, and then finally you put those in a timeline. So a timeline is 
a sequence of sequences. It doesn't add any new playback behavior, but it's useful for organizing your screencast. OK, case study one is timeline flattening. So the timeline that we have looked, looked at is hierarchical. You have all these sequences, parallels, tracks, clips, and gaps. But FFmpeg, which I'm using to render the final video, it doesn't know about hierarchical timelines. It doesn't know about gaps, even. It, it wouldn't know what to do with a gap. So what FFmpeg cares about are video streams and audio streams. So we need to take this hierarchical structure and trim, like, crush that down into just one video track and one audio track. That can be more easily uh, used together with FFmpeg. So graphically, we can look at this uh, with this example. So here we see a hierarchical timeline being flattened into a flat timeline. And note here that the uh, implicit gaps in the hierarchical timeline are explicitly represented in the flat one. Otherwise, we might get uh, incorrect like offsetting and stuff. This process also decides what frames are used for the gaps, uh, small detail. So how do we write in a property test for this? So one thing that we can do, a simple one, would be to check that the duration of the hierarchical timeline is the same duration as the one of the flat timeline. So we're not making it shorter or longer by flattening. Such a test would look like this from the code base. Uh, for all timelines uh, with, uh, within the range of 0 to 20, growing exponentially, where are all parallels uh, have clips. That's an important property. Uh, if we flatten that, then the duration of the original hierarchical timeline should be the same as the flat one. Okay. Another thing we want to check is that we're not losing clips or duplicating clips or doing anything weird uh, there. So here we generate the timeline in the same manner as before, but we check that all the video clips that occur in the hierarchical one occur exactly uh, the same in the flat one. So I'm, I have a few helpers here for extracting the clips. There are other properties on timeline flattening, such as how video gaps are padded with still frames. This is a sort of complicated process because um, it can only pick frames from clips within the parallel itself. It can't reach like outside the parallel currently. This is something that I wanted to change, and I would probably do that by rewriting the tests, asserting the new behavior, and then start changing the code. Uh, but anyway, there, there's some complexity there. Uh, there are also properties for checking that no matter how you group things, uh, if they should have the same playback behavior, then it doesn't matter how you group them. OK. This was a showcase of testing a pure function. It's pretty simple. Um, let's look at something slightly harder. OK, the video scene classification. So composition can automatically classify video scenes in your imported video. And these are. Uh, it, it finds either moving segments, which are consecutive non-equal frames, or still segments, which are at least s seconds of consecutive near-equal frames. Okay, So s is some threshold that I'm defining. So I don't want still segments to be like one frame, and then it's moving, and then it's still, and then it's moving. It can't be too choppy, because then it would pause or consider the space between where I uh, you know, type characters as still segments would work. So I need some threshold there. And also, the near equality is because I might have some compression artifacts and stuff in my video, so I don't want it to stumble on one pixel being slightly different. But it's very simple. It's just comparing all the pixels in parallel. OK, so S is the threshold that you can set for the minimum duration of still segments. And then there are some edge cases. Like the first segment is always considered moving, and the last one can be shorter than S, even if it's still segment, because it doesn't have any backtracking capabilities. So I wrote the first version of this um, classifier, and I wanted some way of testing it and assuring that it was correct. So I wrote a tool that takes the classified frames and outputs another video where the moving frames are tinted with green color, and the still frames are tinted with red color. And it outputs this video, and I can look at it and see, OK, yeah, my classifier is good. Um, what you're see, seeing here 
is the classifier today, basically, how it's working now. When I wrote the classifier, it did not work this well. Uh, it was a mess, and it was just flipping back and forth in the wrong places, and it was horrible. And it turned out that I couldn't really use this as a way of debugging and improving my classifier. The feedback loop was not great. It took like a minute to, to do this process of tinting a video, so very slow process. And it was just flipping back and forth really fast. I couldn't see any, like, how does this relate to my code and uh, why is it wrong? So this wasn't very effective uh, in terms of testing. Instead, I decided to use property-based testing. I started with some examples, I think, but got tired of writing them, so um, started doing property-based testing instead. And I found pretty early that if, if I want to test this classifier, I can't really generate random pixels and then have a test that decides if the classifier outputs or classifies the correct uh, moving and still segments, because that test would be a classifier in itself. That's a pretty common thing with testing, right? The tests become as complicated as the, the initial, the, the system under test, right? So I was struggling with this, and I found a way of testing this which is sort of backwards and perhaps a bit surprising. Instead of generating the input, the pixel frames, I'm generating the output. And it looks sort of like this. I'm generating a high-level representation of what I expect as an output of this system, of this classifier. So this could be, in, in this example, we have four seconds of, of moving, uh, three seconds of still, and eight seconds of moving. Then we go backwards and derive the input based on the expected output. So here I generate a stream of, of frames with pixels. And I'm using a pretty silly technique here, but uh, the moving segments are alternating frames between gray and white, just flipping back and forth, and the still segments are just all black. So this will trigger the correct behavior in the classifier. It's not very realistic, but it, it works okay. You could make this more realistic with more randomness in the pixels, but it's, it's pretty hard to do that. And this, uh, this works very well, actually. Then I run the classifier on those pixel frames, and with the result, I can write properties and uh, compare the expected output to the actual output. This is also known as an oracle generator. I think it was Hillel Wayne who said that, uh, used that name for it. OK, I have two properties that I want to show you based on this. One is pretty simple. It's that the classified still segments must be at least s seconds long. That were the requirements or the sort of specification of this classifier. Uh, and I have to ignore the last segment. That's the edge case where it can be shorter. The second property is that the classified moving segments within a video should have the correct timestamps. And I can compare the actual timestamps that it found with the expected ones from the generated data. OK, so let's look at some code for this. Um, yeah, going to have some water. First, I'm generating the min minimum still segment length or duration. I need both the number of frames and the time, but that's step one here. It's a bit messy code, so bear with me here, but um, I'll try to explain it. Step two, we're generating the expected output segments. So we're constructing this generator with a lot of ranges and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to dig into the details too much, but it, one of these ranges says that the still segments have to be at least min still segment frames uh, of duration so that we have valid input data or valid expected output data. OK, now comes the trick. We convert that expected output back to pixel frames in step three. And in step four, we run the classifier with that threshold that we have generated, with the pixel frames that we have derived from generated expected output data, uh, and then we count uh, how long they are. Finally, I'm doing a little sanity check, just checking that we have the same number of frames. Uh, and in step six, we do the actual assertion. We traverse and check that all the still segments have the correct uh, duration, that they are at least means the still segment time. Okay. Running lots of tests, everything is good. You can go home, or I was at home. But anyway, <laughs> this is not my work, like day job. Um, all right, second property. 
we want to make sure that the scenes have the correct time spans. Uh, all this code is basically the same as before, so I'll just skip it. Uh, step three, same here, we're generating pixel frames. Step four is a little bit more involved. Um, we have to uh, figure out what are the expected time spans from this data that we have generated, and we also need to have the full duration of the video. So let's figure that out. Step five, we classify all the frames, and here we see that the classifier is actually a two-step process. So first we classify each frame and sort of tag them or if they're moving or still, and then in step six, uh, we classify which are the time spans of the moving scenes. Okay, in step seven, we just compare that the expected ones are the same as the actual classified ones. Okay, uh, can I go home now? Uh, no, I can't because I have test errors. This big junk just thrown at me. Um, this was pretty good because this, this turned out like one week before a talk on this subject. I, I thought everything was good. Uh, I wrote some better tests and I had lots of errors, so that was fun. Um, and I found this. So if you look at the diff in the bottom here, you can see that it says uh, it should have been, I'm not sure if you can see, but yeah, um, it should have been between zero and one second. That should have been a moving segment. And if you look at the generated data under line t uh, to 10, it's a scene of 10 frames, so that's one second. That matches up. It should have been a moving segment between zero and one. But instead, we have a moving segment between 0 and 0 0.6. So where does 0 0.6 come from? Uh, that's a mystery. I couldn't find anything wrong with the generated data here, so I was starting to look at the implementation code instead. And I found in the implementation code that there was this curious hard-coded value, 0 0.5. Also, I was getting 0 0.6 over and over again, like slightly different Example, slightly different data, but always the 0 0.6. So, yeah, something was, was making me curious about the 0 0.5 that I found. And it looks sort of like this. Um, the classifier is essentially a fold over a stream of frames. And this stripped down version, I'm uh, sort of simplifying it here. Uh, this is to highlight the, one of the bugs that I found. So the accumulator in this fold holds vectors of previously seen but not yet classified frames. This little state machine. And in the first state branch here, in still state, um, it uses the, the value min equal time for still. And if you look in the where clause in the bottom, you see min, uh, min equal time for still being defined as 0 0.5. It should have used min still segment time that's passed as an argument. So this is likely some sort of residue of me refactoring the code and removing hard-coded stuff, but not removing everything. So it used this value uh, to incorrectly classify, frame, uh, to classify frames. Frames that should have been moving ended up being still. So that's why I didn't get the full zero to one second segment. But why didn't I get 0 0.5? Why did I get 0 0.6? Well, it turns out I also had like an off by one bug in here. And with a frame rate of 10 frames per second, uh, that's uh, 100 milliseconds per frame, so 0 0.6 instead of 0 0.5. So one frame was classified with the wrong uh, still or moving. So summing this up, the classify movement function here is, the, the real one is like 30 lines of Haskell, and I managed to mess this up in three separate ways in the same time. Uh, but with these property tests, I could quickly find these errors, and I can nail them down with like minimal, minimal examples that almost, it's almost embarrassing that they find hard-coded values in my code, which I can't find. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I think this was a good, uh, good testament. But actually, if we move back a bit, uh, before I found these bugs, there were uh, bugs in my specification or in my thinking. So before I could even you know, write these tests, I found that the, the, the version I had initially with uh, that color tinting test and, and all that, that was totally wrong. It was, just couldn't work. And when I started thinking more about that and got the specification right, I found that the generators were wrong. Um, they, they didn't really uh, uphold the invariance that I needed. So I was using generators to generate the color values for the frames. 
and I had bugs, and it, uh, Hedgehog tried to shrink, and then it shrunk down the color values, shrinking all the color, colors down to black, which is zero. So I got other errors when it was doing shrinking because I didn't think about that. So it's pretty hard to, to generate uh, the frame data with, uh, with Hedgehog, I think, um, or with any, any technique like this. Anyway, I fixed all these bugs that I found, uh, many tests running, and then I ran the actual application and imported video and edited the screencast. And everything was just glorious. Everything just worked. It was so much better than before. And I had done screencasts with the old version. And I was frustrated and uh, angry with it, but I didn't know why it wasn't working as, as it, I thought it should. So that was pretty cool. OK, final case study, uh, integration testing. So here I tried to apply property-based testing on the entire application to, to test like larger properties or larger behaviors. <laughs> And uh, the one that I'm going to share is undo redo. So I've, I've had a simple implementation of undo redo, which was implemented as two stacks of the entire application state was pushed onto a stack for the undo states uh, or the redo stack for the redo states. And if you do a lot of edits in your screencasts, this grows pretty dramatically. And this consumed like gigabytes of disk space and RAM, and my computer was crashing, and Linux and stuff. So yeah, that was fun. And I decided to do something about this, because I couldn't use the application anymore. Uh, and what you, I, I guess you could optimize this and have some sort of windowing uh, with the undos, or you could maybe collapse it some other way. Uh, probably the code could be optimized. But I decided to rewrite this using uh, invertible actions, so not storing all the states, but instead storing what the edits were about. And to do this refactoring, I decided to first cover this application in property-based test at this high level. So testing undo works like this. Generate the initial state of the application. Generate a sequence of undoable commands. Run all of those commands, and then run undo commands for each original command, so the same number of undo commands as original commands. And finally, assert that the initial state is the same as the state we end up with. So here's the, the code for this test. Uh, we generate a timeline and a focus uh, and the initial state for the entire application. Finally, we generate a sequence of commands. These are wrapped in events in this application, so that's the last part there. Uh, up to 100 commands we can have. Then we run the full application. I have this helper called run timeline stub with exit. It's basically running the whole application, but not with the GUI. So it's sort of stubbing out the GUI, and it's not doing anything uh, like FFmpeg rendering or whatever. But it's running most of of the application, like all the application logic, all the modal states, and, and everything. Also, the, the classifier and stuff like that, if you would. So uh, we run all the events. That's all the original commands. Get a new state back called before undos. We run undo events for all the events that we had before. And then we have a new state called after undos. And then we compare the timelines that we started with and after doing all the undos. And they should be the same. Testing redo is very simple, uh, very similar, sorry. Um, also generating initial state, generating a lot of commands, uh, running all of those commands, but then running undo for all of them and running redo for all of them. And then assert that we end up in the state we were in before starting the undos. So this part looks exactly the same, uh, the, the initial setup. But here, I'm running all the commands, then I'm running all the undos, then I'm running all the redos, and asserting that the timeline is the same before we started undoing as after we re redid all the commands. OK? And these tests uh, didn't change during this whole refactoring. And I was working on this refactoring for like two weeks. I had lots and lots of test errors. Uh, but essentially, these tests were stable all the way through, and they made this whole refactoring possible. 
I found huge amounts of bugs and like off by one indices all over the place. Uh, I got inconsistent focus. So the focus is like a cursor into the timeline. So when you move with the arrow keys, it jumps around and it has a bunch of rules how you can move around. Uh, this was getting out of bounds and, and stuff like this all over the place. And many of these actions, they are expressed as actions that are invertible. So they're sort of inverted in terms of themselves. So adding a clip, the inverse of that is removing a clip. Um, copying a clip and pasting it somewhere else is uh, implemented in terms of adding and, and removing and so on. But these inverses didn't really work out in all cases. And depending on where you were navigating, they could uh, trigger weird bugs. So I had lots of bugs for two weeks. I was, that was a horrible period. But in the end, every, every test passed. And I opened up the GUI and did some editing. And everything just worked. Uh, this seems like too good to be true. But it, uh, that's my experience here. So um, yeah, that was fun. Uh, I have a bunch of other like, uh, integration level tests for uh, the consistency between the focus and timeline. Uh, like. Yeah, I, I think I can skip this part, actually. It's not too, too interesting. So um, OK, it's time to wrap up. Property-based testing is not only for testing like small, ideal, pure functions. I guess you'll start there, and most tutorials start there, because it's easier to, to grasp what it's about. It's sort of the essence. Uh, but I would argue that property-based testing is very useful, even for effectful stuff. It doesn't have to be pure. And you can use it all the way up to integration testing. And you can do model-based testing for entire systems. This is still sort of white box testing. But you can do black box testing as well. Uh, very powerful. I find the process very interesting also. It's sort of this iterative or almost TDD-like process where you think about your specification. Um, then you think about how to write generators and tests that match that specification. And then you'll start finding bugs, probably. And you fix those, and you go back to your specification and refine that and, and loop like that. And when I've used this technique in, in composition, the video editor, uh, it's made it possible for me to refactor this quite, quite heavily. And uh, yeah, it, it's made the application, application much better in the end. I found bugs not only in my imp implementation, but also in how I thought about things and my tests. So very interesting journey. And it's been super fun. I can really recommend doing this. If you want to learn more about this stuff, I can recommend these references um, as a starting point. And also, I've been writing up some articles uh, based on this talk uh, it, at my website. So it's a series of articles called Property-Based Testing in a Screencast Editor. Uh, there are three ones up. And I think there will be at least one more and other things coming along. So. Check that out if you like this stuff. And uh, yeah, with that, I want to say thank you for listening. Maybe we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, how can I be sure that the generated test, uh, generated test data covers the, the spectrum or the, the, all the inputs I want to test? Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, so with Hedgehog that I'm using now, I don't have any like, super good way of seeing what the test data is. Uh, but this is a, a sort of a rhetorical question, because Felix has just posted a PR to Hedgehog uh, to be able to do what's called labeling in QuickCheck. So you can, uh, you can sort of annotate your tests with labels and say that, uh, OK, this particular generated input w is classified or labeled as uh, a, an edge case. Or this was the empty list. And this was uh, you know, over some threshold. You can put uh, arbitrary labels on, on the data. And then you can get statistics and saying, like, OK, I have 20% of these cases tested. Because if you don't do that, you might be sort of testing in, in blind here. You, you would not know how many cases uh, have I really tested uh, that I'm interested in. In QuickCheck, you can also take this a bit further. You can fail tests based on this. And you can have 
uh, the test framework decide on how many tests it has to run based on your um, desired distribution between these labels. So yeah, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, this is indeed like a, um, what would you say, a challenge in property-based testing to, to introspect and to see that you're testing the right things. Yeah. Yeah? So, if I understand well, your, your test, uh, property-based testing framework is not kind of an extension of John Luch's uh, picture, but something in parallel, and so you want to import some of the features? Yes. Yes, so QuickCheck is sort of the original yeah. testing framework, yeah. Uh, and Hedgehog is a new one that takes some different approaches, especially around uh, generators. Uh, and they, I think there's like a n nice cross-pollination and, and sort of healthy uh, competition between them right now. And Hedgehog is also ported to, uh, I think, Scala and F-sharp and some, a bunch of languages, so yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm trying to be a bit careful about like, how many tests I run and how big the, the, the sequence of commands and so on. Um, from the top of my head, I think like, running, um, I, I think it's like 1,000 tests with 100 commands uh, at a maximum takes a few seconds, like five seconds maybe. Uh, so it's, it's pretty tractable to run this. Uh, it's not like running all day <laughs> or something. Yeah. And you can always, like, if you have, many people do short test runs or few few test examples locally, and then they have CI where they run for hours, or you can do stuff like that. Okay, yeah, oh, one more. Was this last booth, what about that? Last booth, oh, yeah, that, that was just the, the fun, uh, wait. I need to have, like, credits for, oh, where did it go? That was the dog, that one. <laughs> Have to do the credits, yeah. Okay, thanks for, for listening.